Welcome to Modern Cross-Browser Testing with Selenium in Java with Andrew Knight. Andrew Knight, also known as Pandy, is the automation panda. He's a software quality champion who loves to help people build better quality software. In the past, he's built large-scale test automation, test automation projects that run continuously and reliably. Currently, as a developer advocate at Apple Tools, Pandy helps folks make their app visually perfect. He also serves as director of Test Automation University, which offers a multitude of free courses on software testing from the world's leading instructors. An avid supporter of open source software, Pandy is a Playwright ambassador, as well as the lead developer for Boa Constrictor, the .NET screenplay pattern. He's also the author of an upcoming book on software testing with Manning Publications. You can check out his tech blog at automationpanda.com and follow him on Twitter, at Automation Panda. During today's session, Andy will be referencing a number of tools and examples. He's compiled all of them into a GitHub repository for you. You can click the icon on the toolbar to check it out. And with that, Andy, it's all yours. Uh, as Sam said, my name is Fanny Knight. I'm Automation Panda, developer advocate at Apple Tools, and TAU director. And I'm so excited to be here today to be talking about cross-browser testing with Selenium. So before I get into today's content, I actually have a question for y'all. I'm going to send this as a poll question through their on, our ON24 platform. Um, I'd like to know, how do you do cross-browser testing? Um, do you do cross-browser testing at all? Uh, when you, if you do it, do you do it locally? Do you use uh, a do-it-yourself tool like Selenium Grid, or do you use some sort of cloud-based vendor? I'll give a, a moment uh, for everyone to answer, um, wait for those poll question answers to come in. All right, let's see what the poll results say. Okay, wow. This is a really interesting spread here. So it looks like about one out of five of y'all don't do cross-browser testing. Interesting, okay. I've been in places where we haven't done it either just because of whatever reason, but I'd be interested to hear more about those stories later. Looks like, excuse me, almost half of folks do it locally. 15% here use Selenium Grid. All right, cool, cool. I see y'all. Um, I was one of y'all. And about 20% using, or 19% here using a cloud based vendor. So we all know the names. Hopefully, Apple Tools is in that. Cool. Well, that's great. So let's talk about cross browser testing with Selenium. I probably should have started off by defining what is cross browser testing. Uh, Cross-browser testing is the practice of taking your, your web application and testing it on different browsers, such as Chrome, Firefox, Safari, um, Internet Explorer, so hopefully we're not doing that one anymore because it's dead by Microsoft. And the reason why we want to do cross-browser testing is because browsers are different. You know, the, the, there are minor differences between them, and now things have converged a lot more than they have been in the past. But still, there could be small rendering things or text on top of text, or just little quirks within JavaScript engines and such. So we want to make sure that we're testing against all the different browsers that our users might be using. And not only just different browser types, but it also includes things like browser versions, going back a version or two or three. Uh, or things like viewport sizes, right? Do we want tiny little windows like we're on a mobile platform or do we want like big honkin' 1600, 1080p, 4K, I don't even know what, <clears throat> big old windows. And to a lesser extent, um, it could involve testing on different operating systems too. Uh, though in my opinion, I, I haven't seen many differences whether you're testing on Chrome, on Windows or Linux or Mac OS, that still might be a requirement in a highly regulated industry that you might have. So I'm going to share my screen. Hopefully we don't have a, a tech break with this. Okay, let's see, share my screen. Boom. My talk today is going to be entirely screen sharing and live coding. I don't have a PowerPoint slide to share with all of y'all. I think PowerPoint gets a little boring and wouldn't. I want to show you actually how we go about and do this. So as Pam mentioned before, I actually have a GitHub repository that has all of the example code we're going to cover today. 
you can get it through the on 24 platform. I've got it shown here, Apple tools slash workshop, CBT, Selenium, Java. In this, not only do I have the example code, but I also have a full workshop markdown file that provides all the instructions and details of everything we'll be covering today. So if you want to go back and reference anything from today's talk, or if you want to stay, share this with someone on your team or one of your friends, you can shoot them a link to this repository and they should have everything they need to get up and started. Alrighty. So the plan for today is we are going to start by writing a, an automated test in Java with Selenium WebDriver. And we are going to try to run this on different browsers. And we're going to see how that goes. Then what we're going to do is we're going to see some of the limitations that that has, um, some of the shortcomings, some of the problems. Talk about ways we can try to scale our cross-browser testing. And ultimately, what we'll do is we will rewrite our automated test using Apple tools with Selenium WebDriver in Java to show how you can really simplify your cross-browser testing with uh, visual testing techniques. To do all that, we're going to need a demo web app to test. Um, we could use any web application out there. I mean, we could use Google, we could use like Instagram or Facebook, we could make our own, whatever. But I wanna kind of keep things simple because we only have about an hour here in our webinar. So right here, we have the Apple Tools demo website. Uh, this is supposed to model like a basic banking application. And we're here on the login page of this particular web app. Nothing fancy, right? You've got a, an icon, you've got username, password fields, and really you can type in anything. You don't even need to register an account. Click the sign in button and it will load this home page that's supposed to look like it's a, your bank account or something. You've got, you know, your total balance, your available credit. You've got a list of recent transactions different account types on the side, different, you know, all this good stuff. Right here. So the, the test that we're going to automate is going to be very basic. It's going to be load that login page, perform login, lo let it load this page and make sure that this is right, that it, it loaded correctly. So like I said, kind of like a smoke test. Like, can, can you perform basic login? So let's jump into some code here and see what that would look like in Selenium WebDriver. Here is that project that I mentioned before. Uh, it is a Java project. Uh, dependency management is going to use Maven for our, our core test framework. I'm using JUnit. Uh, we could use any language. We could use Selenium, Cypress, Playwright, WebDriver, IO, whatever. Um, and we could, it, within Java, we could use any test framework. JUnit, TestNG, Cucumber, whatever. Um, I just chose what I thought were kind of basic or, or what were very popular ones that a lot of people know, very straightforward, nothing fancy here. I've loaded this project up in IntelliJ IDEA. That is the IDE I use. You could use Eclipse, whatnot. So in the project, uh, because it is a Maven project, I've got my source folder, and then I put everything under test because these are test cases. And so I have this class called traditional test.java. And this is where we're going to perform our, our basic um, login test automation. So uh, like I said before, we're using JUnit and specifically JUnit 5. We have our test class here. And since we're using Selenium WebDriver, I have my WebDriver objects. I have my WebDriver as well as a WebDriver wait that's going to help me do um, some automatic waiting as I interact with the page. Uh, <clears throat> so to set up this test case, uh, I have a before each method, and it's usually good practice when you're doing WebDriver-based testing that every test gets its own WebDriver instance. So uh, my before each method, I've called it start WebDriver, and here is where we're going to construct the driver object. Um, how I'm going about doing this, though, is I need to know which browser I want to target. So um, since we're doing cross-browser testing, I want more than one browser. And so what I have done is I've set this up to 
read an environment variable named browser to specify the browser type. By default, it'll be Chrome, but we could also have value like Firefox. So I'm going to read that browser name in from this environment variable. And then we are going to um, build the appropriate web driver object based on that browser name. Now here, like I said, I've only done Firefox and Chrome. I could add others. Like for example, I could mi add Microsoft Edge. I could add uh, Safari since I'm on a Mac on this machine. But just to keep things simple, we'll stick to two. Construct it. Then I'm going to construct a web driver wait object using that driver. And I'm going to set a um, standard uh, duration time of 15 seconds. That means if I have to wait more than 15 seconds for anything, it'll raise a timeout exception. So like we have a before, we also have an after each method. And what this will do is after every single test, it will make sure to explicitly quit the web driver. You always want to do that, clean up your web driver process, don't leave zombies, especially important on, let's say, a, a CI server. You don't want to have like a billion web driver processes running. And this is all fairly boilerplate stuff for running web driver. So create it, close it. Let's move on to our test case here. So this test class will have one test case method. It's going to be that login test. And what I've done is I've broken this down into four steps, each one with a helper method. So the four steps are load login page, verify login page, perform login, and then finally verify the main page. <laughs> action, verification, action, verification. Testing is all interaction plus verification. That's all that's going on here. So my first method here loading the login page. What we're going to do is we're going to load that page I showed, demo.appletools.com. Um, don't worry about this, this demo site selection thing here. I'll come back and explain that in a moment. Um, just for the, the typical case, it's going to load that um, the URL that I showed before. I'll come back and explain this later. The second step to verify the login page here we have a bunch of verifications. And it's using this helper method wait for appearance. Uh, that is up here. All the wait for appearance method does is it calls that web driver wait object. It's waiting until the particular locator that you pass in is or becomes um, available on the page. I'm doing a basic like existence check, right? Find the elements. Did you find any element with that particular link locator, meaning you have a list where the number of elements in the list is greater than one? Did you find it? Yes. Boom. So what are the elements that we're going to wait to appear on the login page? Well, we can wait for that logo. We can wait for the username and password fields. We can wait for that login button. We can also wait for that remember me checkbox. These are all kinds of things we would expect to, to appear on that login page. And if they don't appear, then we would say, oh, something's broken. It's a very basic verification here. Third step, performing login. Here's where we'll see some of those Selenium web driver interaction methods that probably would be familiar. Driver, find element by username, enter some username. Driver, find element by password, enter a password. Uh, again, like I said, you can use any password on this dummy website. And then finally, find the login button and click it. A uh, side note here, we could use something like page object model or screenplay pattern to better model these interactions. Uh, but for the sake of keeping this um, example very basic and um, easy to pick up and read for everyone, I've just put raw Selenium calls. So finally, fourth step is after we've logged in, we want to verify everything on the main page. And this is where things start to go off the rails a bit. So I'm just going to keep scrolling and scrolling. And we can see this is a, a very, very large method here, right? What is going on in this verification method? Well, I have a bunch of wait for appearance calls. I want to make sure all different kinds of elements are appearing on this page. Things like the logo again things like those account types on the side, things like the menu, just making sure, hey, 
on our main page, all of these should be here. But then there are a few, a few other checks that are more than just a, a flat appearance check. So here, if you recall on that main page, there was a timed message. Let me show that again. This message here, your nearest branch closes in a certain amount of time. It would be good to verify that not only does this message appear, but that it gives some sort of timestamp value. If I come back here, um, what I want to do is I want to assert true that I have some, that, that uh, sorry, I want to assert that the text value for that time, time text matches this particular regular expression. Your nearest branch closes in and then gives some sort of hours, minutes, seconds. Another check I could do is on the menu element names. So if I flip back to this page again, uh, these menu elements over here, if I look at them, I've got things like card types saying credit cards and debit cards. I've got lending saying loans and mortgages. It'd be really nice to make sure that those names appear as expected. So I could come back here, and this logic might be a little bit, uh, a little bit intense. <laughs> Not too bad though, hopefully. So what we're doing here is we're going to get all the menu elements based on this particular CSS selector. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to transform them into a list of strings where I'm going to get out the text, make everything lowercase, and turn it into a list. That way I've got a list of strings that I can more easily manipulate. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, okay, well, those are the actual names that are appearing on the page. What are the expected names that they should be? And so I've made a list here of all the expected names, again, lowercase, just to avoid any sort of equality issues. And then I'm performing an assertion that the expected values are equal to my actual values. Right. So we had to scrape the page, do some data transformation, and then line up our assertion. So straightforward, a little more complex than the others, but eh, not too bad. Finally, we can also check the transaction statuses. So if I go back to the page, you know, uh, here at the bottom, these recent transactions, there's a whole table full of values. So what I want to do is I want to, let's say I want to check the status um, fields here, complete, declined, pending. And I want to make sure that all of these are um, proper, that there's nothing missing, that there there's no wrong kind of status that's not approved. And so what I can do here is I can do a similar scrape, transform, and verify. So I am getting all the status elements from this XPath. The XPath is a little gnarly, <laughs> as XPaths usually are. I heard a friend once say, friends don't let friends use XPath, but sometimes you don't have a choice. But then after we get those elements, again, it's the same thing. We're going to get the text value of those elements. We're going to formulate a list of acceptable names, and we're going to make sure this time, not necessarily that, it, that these two are equal, but rather we're going to assert that all of the status names are, are elements of the acceptable names list. So slightly different at the, at the end there, but still verify. We can run this test. So I'm going to run the traditional test. You can run it here locally, and it should pop up the window. Hopefully it appears on this window and not something else. Here we go. Boom. That may have gone a little fast for the screen capture to catch, but what happened if you missed it was Chrome came up and then um, it loaded the web page, did the login, and then closed. And the test is passed. So we know that these conditions worked. And that's great. And so that was on Chrome. If I edit my configurations, I could say uh, browser equals Firefox. And it should work on Firefox. Let's give that a try. Oh, Firefox is not working. This is valid in this context. Well, here's your first issue with cross-browser testing. Sometimes on local machines, things just blow up. <laughs> oh boy, oh, what happened here? Could not start new session. Invalid address. I'm curious here. Okay. 
Echo drivers off. Okay. Let's, uh, let's see. One moment, friends. Uh, applications. Firefox. Let's see what's going on. Why we can't do this? Oh, had it just done an update and it wouldn't. Okay, so it's up now. All right, let's try this again. See if it'll let me do Firefox this time. Nope. Found argument allow origins, which wasn't expected valid in this context. Okay, well, this is going to be fun. Hmm. Let me check my Firefox version. Firefox, back Firefox. Oh, it's applying an update. Maybe we're not up to date. So one of the frustrations with local cross-browser testing is sometimes the browsers on your machine like this just aren't fully ready or they aren't up to date or over time updates may happen or not happen and so one day it may be running and the next day kaboom things blow up like this uh no i don't want to make firefox in the primary browser okay so what version are we at now let's see about firefox oh wow we were way behind date oh okay i might have to update echo driver as well but let's, let's try it one more time see if this is any better nope still Complaining about that thing. All right, so let me try something else. Go to the driver. So yeah, we could easily see that Chrome had no issues, but Firefox is just not not having it today. So let's go download this and do all the needful to get this working right. Uh, is that the right one? I hope that's the right one. Let's open it up and see. Boom, boom. If we open it, yeah, I'm going to have to open like this. Open. Do, 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 do. Yep, OK. Terminate. All right. About unlocking it. Oh, cool. Somebody sent a message. Let me get this latest version up to date in here. Pseudo move. Actually. Which, which gecko driver? Yes, yeah, so I thought. Pseudo move. Download gecko driver to user. So golden. Okay, now if we do gecko driver, it should. Okay, we're running there. Okay. So clearly we can see cross browser testing on a local machine is a pain. <laughs> uh, X adder D. Okay, well, I'm going to try that suggestion in just a moment if this doesn't work. Oh, wrong page. Sorry. I have too many windows open. All right, so one more time. Let's see. There we go. We weren't up to date. So now, as we have seen, we want to do cross-browser testing because we can test different browsers and all. But trying to maintain all this of our all this ourselves is a pain. Um, I've had lots of hands-on experience with this, so I could just jump to things like, oh, maybe the browser's out of date. Maybe the web driver executable's out of date. And we saw this here in real time. I couldn't have staged this better myself, I promise you. So here, and it's like, okay, so it took me, me a few seconds to do it, but um, others may not have that same kind of experience or the same kind of like immediate reaction of, oh, what was this? Or maybe that wasn't the case, there was another issue, and we could be spending our entire webinar blowing the time of, why can't Pandy get Firefox working, right? Um, it's something that is a hassle, um, and it's something that, that it has been a hassle in our industry for quite a long time. So we can do local cross-browser testing, but that is one of the limitations. You really have to know your own machine. Um, some other limitations with cross-browser testing. If you notice, I had to explicitly change between Chrome and, and Firefox, right? I had to go into my configurations and come in here and set this to something different. You know, if I want to go back to Chrome, I could do this. And I'd have to run it again. 
And so there's a, a limitation to how much testing you can do on any one machine at a given time, right? You know, I can, I can play around here manually and change things off, but on a local machine, it only scales up so much. Or if I wanted to run these in parallel, you know, your machine is typically going to, typically going to max out around, um, like one web test per processor or per core that you have. So there's only so much that you can scale up on a given machine. So what do we do about that, right? Mm. There's a couple ways that we can try to scale beyond just the local machine here and hopefully get some advantage. So as I mentioned in the survey question, one way you can do is with a tool like Selenium Grid. A Selenium Grid, I can pull it up here for everyone to see. Selenium.dev. Selenium Grid is part of the Selenium project, the same project that brings you WebDriver. Grid is a scale-out tool that lets you run your WebDriver sessions on remote machines in a cluster rather than on your local machine. So your test automation will still run on your local machine or let's say a particular CI server. But the WebDriver sessions, meaning your Chrome and uh, Firefox and Safari browsers are all gonna be on someone else's machine. <laughs> Selenium Grid is really nice because it lets you add any number of nodes, any number of browsers. You can tune, like, okay, how how many sessions can be running at a time. And with Selenium 4, they've completely revamped the architecture. Uh, let me see if we can find it. There's a really good diagram here. Uh, architecture, here we go. Of course, it's not going to be on display when I need it, right? <laughs> uh shoot that's anticlimactic here we go this is what i'm looking for sorry friends so they're not going to show the old one so the classic selenium 3 architecture would have a hub with multiple nodes and the thought was you create a hub that's what gets all the routing information to and from the automation and it picks uh, uh web driver sessions from the nodes so it's hub and node architecture with Selenium 4, you have a, a much more distributed architecture that handles load and can scale a lot better. You've got things like the router, the session queue, the session map, distributor. You can even have an event bus if you'd like. Now, I haven't built this one myself. It is more complex, but it does have greater resilience and greater scale. You can still do the classic hub and node if you like. So Selenium Grid is really nice because you get to customize. You get to choose what browsers you want. Uh, the challenge with Selenium Grid is even though you have the, the, the open source project um, and the, the jar file to run it, you still need to build this yourself, meaning you need to do all of the infrastructure for the machines that run this. Are you going to run this on VMs? Are you going to run this in Docker containers? Are you going to run this as an on an... Uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Sorry. Are you going to run this on a Kubernetes cluster? That's what I'm trying to say. <laughs> Make some pods, put it out there, right? There's all of that is up to you. And then maintaining it is also up to you. So you've got to do the networking to make sure everything lines up and hopefully things will work. Um, and my previous, on my previous project at my previous company, we had a hub and node Selenium grid architecture that we ran. And it was fairly successful. Uh, we, we it, its performance was about as fast as when we would run on our local machines, which was really nice. We kept it all in Azure in the same Azure sphere, I guess you would call it, so that it could keep things networking very fast. And um, we we could get you know 50 to 100 tests in parallel on any given one of our school name grid instances. So it was very nice. But it was a heck of a beast to set up because we had to learn it the first time and put everything in place. And then sometimes it would just randomly crash. <laughs> like we'd be running a test and we'd be running, you know, full scale and halfway through, kaboom, something would happen. And all the tests would start failing. We look in, the Selenium grid had fallen over. We try to look at console logs and stuff to figure out why, but a lot of times it was kind of a black box. We ended up fighting infrastructure as much as fighting bugs. So there, there are those challenges as well, that you have to be up on that. You have to dedicate the resources to doing this yourself. So 
So if you don't use Selenium Grid, what other options do you have? Um, you could use a traditional uh, cross-browser testing vendor. Um, you probably know, have heard names like Sauce Labs or Browser Stack or Lambda Test, right? What they do is essentially <laughs> Selenium Grid as a service. Um, now, I don't know what technology they use within their their platform. I'm not trying to say that they do use Selenium. I don't know that. What I can tell you is like, it's the same kind of thing. Instead of building your own cloud platform with a Selenium Grid, what you're doing is you're, you are licensing their service to say, okay, so in my automation code, I'm going to request a particular browser session. For example, I, let's say I want to request a Chrome session. You bundle up your request as a remote web driver, you request it of said vendor platform, and then they will hook you up with that particular session in their cloud. So you get the benefit of having this scale out, um, art, scale up, scale out architecture without having to build it yourself. You just have to buy it. <laughs> it's a build versus buy thing, right? So instead of you setting up all Slen and Grid stuff, you just say, here's a big old check of money and here are the browser sessions I want, give me. And you get it. So that can be pretty good if you don't want to get into this whole infrastructure thing. Um, and so what happens with those sessions are, okay, you would run your test on whatever browser sessions you request, start to finish, right? Um, and it, a lot of those vendors will charge you for a certain you know, number of sessions or a certain number of users or a certain amount of time. There's different pricing models. Uh, what I have found with those types of vendors uh, is they tend to be expensive and slow. <laughs> uh, I. I have used a lot of different vendors in the past, and typically what I've seen is test running on my local machine versus test running in a vendor platform. Uh, the test running in the vendor platform typically take two to four times as much time to execute the same test. Um, add that up over 100 to 1,000 plus tests in a suite, that can be hours worth of execution time. Um, and over the course of a month or a year, I mean, we're talking days and weeks of just running tests. So it can be much, much slower that way. And it's also not cheap. Um, I, I'm not here to like talk about different pricing models and all that, but like I remember on previous projects looking at some of these price tags and going, ouch, <laughs> ooh, but, uh, I think we're gonna build it ourselves, you know, that kind of thing. But I mean, they, they can still be good, they can still, be a great way to get exposure to cross-browser testing. You don't have to use, go through the nightmare of setting it up yourself or the nightmare of local machines like we just did, right? But is there a, a better way? Um, I think there is. And specifically with visual testing, we can get some really interesting efficiencies with cross-browser testing. So, uh, if you're not sure what visual testing is, that's basically what Apple Tools does, <laughs> right? Apple Tools is an automated visual testing platform where we have visual AI to detect differences in um, web pages over time. The basic premise of visual testing is you capture snapshots of your application, the different pages of your application. So for example, we could capture a snapshot of that login page and of that home page. And every time we run the test, we take another visual snapshot. And when I say snapshot, I mean everything on that page visually, the text, the color, the um, layout, the spacing, the whole shebang bang everything that you would see with human eyes. You capture a snapshot once, every time you make a change and rerun your test, you capture another snapshot. And then what App Tools does is it does a visual diff. It points out anything that's different between those pages whether that's something like a missing button, different text, all those kinds of things. And what's really nice is it uses visual AI. So it's going to focus on changes that matter, right? If you're off by like two pixels of white space, it's not gonna worry too much about that. But if your button's missing, you dang right it's gonna nail it. If we were to look at the, um, back at our, our demo app, now, if we were to capture a visual snapshot of this page, it would actually be a much richer assertion than if we were to 
um, do those Java assertions we saw before, right? If you recall in our code, we check things like, you know, this text and this text here and the statuses, but there's still so much on this page we didn't check. We didn't check any of the other fields in this table. We didn't check the placement of these elements on the page, just that they kind of were there somewhere. And so if I were to take a visual snapshot of this page and compare that over time, it's actually a much richer assertion than those traditional assertions I was writing. So that's visual testing in a nutshell. So getting back to the cross-browser conversation, how does that help with cross-browser testing? Well, what we can do with visual testing is we can take these snapshots of say this, this home page here and not only render them on the browser I'm running, let's say Chrome, but I could render this on any different browser configuration that I want. A snapshot is not just a rasterization of pixels. A snapshot is the full page. It captures the HTML, the CSS, JavaScript, essentially that whole document object mod or DOM. Since I have that full page, what I can do is I can re-render it easily in different browser configurations. So instead of having to run my entire test start to finish on Chrome, on Firefox, on Safari, on Edge, <laughs> on Safari Mobile, <laughs> right? Instead of having to do that start to finish every time, I can run it once on a local machine, let's just say Chrome doesn't matter, and take that snapshot and then I can re-render it on those other browsers that we want. And it's much, much faster to quickly re-render and do that visual comparison than it is to run the whole test start to finish. Um, and to, to do that re-rendering, we can use uh, Apple Tools Ultra Fast Grid. Ultra Fast Grid is a platform, part of Apple Tools, that provides all the different browser combos that you could want. <laughs> so it's got Chrome, it's got Firefox, it's got, it's got all of them. Um, and not only that, but it also has them um, up to two versions back. So you could do the latest as well as minus one, minus two. And you can also set viewport size that you like. So you can exercise the um, responsive web design if your page has that. So let's see how to do that. Uh, to do that, you will need an Apple Tools account. So you can go to appletools.com slash register. Uh, you can sign up with your email. You can sign up with your GitHub account. It's completely free to get started. You get a few um, visual checkpoints every month that you can just kind of play around with. Uh, once you have your account, you can come back into the code. And so I have written, in addition to our traditional test, an ultra fast visual test. <laughs> Basically, same test, same Java, same Selenium web driver, but now I'm going to be doing visual testing with it. So, uh, ultra fast visual test. You can see I still have my web driver object, but now I also have some other Apple tool stuff. And we'll walk through what these pieces are. So, to get set up, I have a before all method, uh, set up and configure runner. This is going to set up Apple Tool stuff for an entire test suite, not just an individual test case. There are shared components that we don't need to repetitively set up each time. So first thing I need to do is I need to get my API key. Uh, this API key comes from your Apple Tools account. When you get your account uh, and then you log into the Apple Tools dashboard, you can find it under your profile. Uh, keep it secret, I'm not gonna share mine. <laughs> Also, I want a, an environment variable to dictate whether I'm going to run this in headless mode or not. Locally here, I won't run it headless, but if I were in, let's say, a CI system, I definitely would want to run it headless. Next, I'm going to create the Apple Tools Visual Grid Runner. This is what tells Apple Tools to run things in the ultra-fast grid, so I can do the re-rendering on all the different platforms. I'm going to set it up with a test concurrency of five, meaning I can run five checkpoints in parallel. Note, if you have a free account, you're stuck at one. Sorry. <laughs> uh, the next thing I'm going to set up is a batch for my visual tests. I'm going to just call it Apple Tools Example, so we can easily identify it. Then I'm going to create a configuration object. I'm going to add the API key and the batch to that config. 
and I'm going to add a slew of browser configs. So here I'm going to add three desktop browsers, Chrome, Firefox, Safari, and I'm going to set different viewport sizes for them so we can exercise responsive design. In addition to desktop browsers, I'm also going to add mobile browsers. Apple Tools allows you to test on mobile browsers via emulation. And so I'm going to add a Pixel 2 in portrait mode and a Nexus 10 in landscape mode. Again, different browsers, different viewport sizes, and also different orientations. So all the tests in my suite will now run against this config. Before each test, I still need to set up my WebDriver, but I also need to set up a little bit more. So here, I've got my WebDriver object, and in this case, I'm just going to use Chrome Driver. Um, you can use whatever browser or driver you want locally on your machine where you run the test. It'll still get rendered on all the different other browsers in Apple Tools UltraFast Group. I'm also going to set an implicit wait time just to keep things simple. Uh, usually, you want to use explicit wait times, but since this is a small example project, I'm not going to worry about that. Now, here's the new stuff. We need to use an Apple Tools Eyes object to capture snapshots. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create the Eyes object, pass in the Visual Grid Runner so it knows where to upload the results. I'm going to set the configuration on that so it knows which browsers and batch to use. And then I'm going to open the eyes to say, hey, test is starting, start recording. Pass in the web driver object. Also going to give it a name of the test and viewport size, that kind of thing. Test cleanup is almost identical. Not only do we quit the browser now, but we also close our eyes <laughs> until the test is over. Uh, and then after all tests are done, we can also print out a result summary to the console. That's usually good just to have it there um, as a, a reference, like in your CI jobs or whatnot. The test steps are the same, but the code is going to be a little different. Uh, the interaction methods are the same. It's the verification methods that are different. So if you remember that verify login page, we had to verify the existence of five elements, right? Instead of those five lines, what I can do now is take a single visual snapshot. Eyes.check, the window, full size, and I'm going to call it the login page. It's going to take a visual snapshot, render. Main page is much more staggering. <laughs> Remember how it took up the entire screen to show all the code here? Again, a one-line visual snapshot call, eyes check, target window fully, the name main page. And this time, I'm going to focus on layout, because some of the text could be different over time. But I want to make sure the layout of the page is good. So here we have our visual snapshots that we're capturing. Um, saves a lot of time and hassle versus traditional assertions. And since I have these visual snapshots, what I can do is I can run this, one te this test once locally, and then we'll see multiple browsers in the UltraFast grid. So let's try that. I'm going to run my ultrafast visual test. Do, 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 do. We should see it pop up. Cool. So it's passed. I'm going to now switch to my browser, and I'm going to go to the Apple Tools Eyes dashboard. We should start to see results populate here. Um, this is tied to my account. If you wanted to see your API key, you could click that. Let's refresh the page. And you can see Apple Tools example. That was that example batch that I was running locally. And you can see all the tests are starting to run here. So we can see, OK, boom. So I had actually run this test before. And so you can see it's, this was the original baseline image of that test. And then here's that new checkpoint that I just took. And there are no visual differences here. Nothing's highlighted. So this checkpoint is passed. And you can see, even though I only ran it once locally, I now have five different tests in the Apple Tools Eyes dashboard. Oops. I thought I said, do not disturb. Sorry about that, friends. Um, but you can see there are five uh, tests, each one for one of those different browsers we have. Chrome, Firefox, Safari, and then the Pixel 2 and the Nexus. So that's how we can do cross-browser testing 
without having to do full start to end run every single test on every browser. <laughs> we can simply re-render the visual snapshots and gain great efficiency. If you look, it might be a little small here, but the batch duration time for these five was 23 seconds. Um, usually it takes at least 23 seconds to run one test one time. Um, that's another advantage of the visual testing here is it's so much faster, it's so much more efficient. Um, you, you don't have the same lag that you would with a, um, like a Selenium grid or a, some sort of traditional vendor. You can, it, it, it really, really optimizes how fast you can run these things. I want to run this test one more time though, and I want to run it, uh, just check here real quick. Okay, good. Um, I want to run it with a website changed. So we remember our basic login page. If I can pull back here, let me go back. This is the login page, but we can have a slightly different version of it. Uh, if I load this, notice what's different now. Image link is broken, button is changed. Uh, if I were to run this with a that tr traditional test, this would probably still pass because it could still get to the username and password and it's hinging on non-visual. But clearly this page should be broken and should flag some sort of failure. Right, because it's, it's not what we would expect. So um, what we can do is, if you recall in that load login page method, there was a, a little bit of extra code there. So what we can do is uh, I created this demo site variable. By default, it's set to the original page. But we can change that. And if we set it to something other than the original page, it will load that broken page. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to use my ultra fast visual test that is changed. We'll run it this time. And we should see some sort of indication that there was a visual difference. So we'll wait for the test to run. Boom, boom, it ran. If we flip back to the ultra fast, or if we flip back to the dashboard, we can see it running in the ultra fast grid. We'll give it just a few moments here. And what we should see is it should identify some visual differences. Boom. Oh, what is this? What we see is that these tests are now marked as unresolved. If we take a look, we can see how Apple Tools identified visual differences, highlights them in a magenta color. So we can see it was very quick to see that the, the um, icon was different as well as the sign in button was different. We could even, uh, refine this comparison a little bit, what I did is I checked the option for show diffs caused by element displacement, or uh, turn off diffs caused by element displacement, sorry. <laughs> so that here, that remember me checkbox was shifted because of another visual difference. Here, Apple Tools can say, okay, well, I know that's the same on both, it just shifted. Let me ignore that as a difference. And so it zeroes in on the icon as well as the sign button. And so if we think this is a, a breaking change, we can say thumbs down and it will fail that test. And what Apple Tools also does, notice how I just clicked the thumbs down once, it will go look at other variations of that snapshot on different browsers and see, oh, is this a similar kind of failure? And it can automatically mark them as failed as well. So here, four out of the five, it automatically marked this, or sorry, I marked one explicitly as failed, three out of the other five, it automatically marks as failed. If I come here, yeah, this one is still kind of like it too, so it failed. Close. And so now when I save those results, it saves them as a failed snapshot. Anytime I rerun the test and those same failing snapshots come up, Apple Tools will automatically mark that as failed. And as soon as the thing is fixed and goes back to the right snapshot, it'll automatically be marked as passed because it'll compare it to the baseline and be okay. And so that's, in a nutshell, how we can do cross-browser testing. Um, we saw how to do it locally. We saw some of the frustration. We talked about Selenium Grid, and we talked about um, you know, maybe a vendor platform. And again, some of the pros and cons of those. And here we've seen how we can use visual testing to really expedite and simplify how we take a more modern approach to cross-browser testing. 
So with that, um, I am going to, or we're going to start Q&A in just a moment. Before we do, I want to say, if you want to learn some more, a great resource is Test Automation University. Uh, I'm hoping you've heard of TAU before. TAU is Apple Tools major community initiative, where we have courses for free online on all topics, testing and automation. And on TAU, we actually have a full visual learning path. So um, on Test Automation University, we do have a visual testing learning path where you can um, take a full curriculum of visual testing courses. Uh, we also have courses that are not about visual testing. So if you're new to Selenium WebDriver in general, we have a whole course on that as well. So be sure to check that out. And I guess, Pam, we have a few minutes left for questions. Uh, first from Rita, if we have side-by-side -side views with scroll bar on each view, would it be able to take the screenshot of each view? Ah, uh, yes. So a really cool thing about Apple Tools is even if you have like a really, really long page that you have to scroll down, it will capture the entirety of that thing, not just what is currently in view on the screen. It will automatically scroll. And there's settings for that for how you stitch things together if you have like a floating footer or something. So yes, you can you can easily cover that. Chris asked, can visual AI take input from something like Figma to use as a comparison? From Figma, uh, the the UX design tool. Um, I've never done that myself. I don't know if anybody has, but I'm pretty sure you could do it. If if there's a way to simply like export screenshots or something, then yes, absolutely. Apple Tools has a um, a way where you can you can do visual diffs diff not just with um, like Selenium WebDriver, but with like give it a, a folder full of, of PNG or JPEG images or even PDFs and it can do the visual comparison there. All right, I have another question from the audience. Uh, early on, Lamar asked, which Java version are you using? I asked because I've never seen VAR, VAR, or VAR, B -A -R, used with Java. Oh, great question. So I believe I'm using Java 17. Let me double check that. Uh, where's my Maven Palm? Yep, so this project, this example project is using Java 17, which I believe is one of the latest versions. Um, but you can use Apple tools all the way back to Java version eight, I believe is supported. Um, I think like the long-term support releases were like eight, 11, 14, and 17, I think is also a, a long-term release. Don't, don't quote me on that. <laughs> Um, I will let the audience know that we have um, links to all of our tutorials and SDKs. Um, there's a, on the left side of your screen, you'll be able to see that. Um, Andy's working on some of those as well, but there is a link where you can see all the SDKs and tutorials that may give you a little um, additional information for that there as well. All right. Another question, uh, another question from Rita. Is it possible to store the results locally without sending the result to the Apple Tools server? Our data and testing result are sensitive and won't be able to be sent outside. Ah, that's a great question. So the way that app visual testing works with Apple Tools is yes, you do need to upload to an, I, an Apple Tools I server, kind of like the dashboard that you would see. But if you have a need where you need to, um, or if, if you have a situation where you ha have to be careful with your data because it's sensitive, you don't want it just going out to any old third party server, we do provide a service where you can have your own private Apple Tools Eyes server. Um, we can help you set that up. It's a, an extra thing. But that way you can kind of keep better control of your data and it's not just floating out there in the, the general file. Okay, great. Um, do the same look for multiple tabs in the same browser, or what is the different code for this? Ah, can we do the same flow for multiple tabs in the same browser? So, um, let me think about this. I'm not quite sure what this question is asking. Um, I mean, with, with Selenium WebDriver, as well as with any um, browser automation tool, there, there are ways that you can do um, testing with multiple tabs. Like, let's say you have a page that opens a window and goes, or sorry, you, 
you're on a page, you click a link, and it opens up a new page in a new window, right? With Selenium WebDriver, that's that's a uh, that's um sorry, I'm trying to think. There there are ways and mechanisms to do that. That's not so much specific to Apple Tools. Um, Apple Tools will capture whatever page that you're currently looking at. Here's one from Anandi J. Visual automation comparison. Is it language independent? For instance, can we use to compare the site displayed in Korean language or Arabic language? Yes. So something you can do is you can actually set it to um, ignore text. So that way, it'll check things like layout. So whatever the layout and the visuals on the page, it'll check that. And whatever the text values in the middle are, it'll be like, oh, whether it's Korean, Arabic, English, Chinese, Whatever language you want, it can ignore that. So you can still have meaningful visual comparison. Well, we are a few minutes after the hour. So I guess we can, we can wrap up. Again, so sorry for some of the technical difficulties with the platform today. Um, if you want to learn more, feel free to reach out to me. Um, I'm on Twitter at Automation Panda. Um, <clears throat> yes, um, make sure to check out our upcoming webinars. Uh, we, we try to host these every so often, stuff to help the community, stuff to help you learn more about testing, whether that's visual testing or any other kind of testing. So on September 8th, we are having a big, big event. It's a rematch of our Let the Code Speak code battle between Cypress and Playwright. So if you saw the first one, amazing. If you didn't, make sure to check it on our events page. There's a recording there. Uh, Cypress Ambassador Philip Crick will be facing off against me, a Playwright Ambassador where we will be developing a larger scale project or test project in each of our respective frameworks and comparing to see which one is better. And you, the audience, gets to vote. So um, that being said, uh, again, thank you so much for attending today's webinar and have fun doing testing.